So just wanted to, first of all, thank everyone for being here today, um, all the attendees, and then also um, Gish Dandula and Dr. Lauren Ledner for taking the time to be here and talk to us about um, your work. So we really appreciate this. And a little bit about online Tibetan education. So we are a volunteer-driven initiative um, with the purpose and mission of preserving the Tibetan language and Tibetan culture. So we've been doing this since 2011. This is our 10th year um, as part of online Tibetan education. And then this is our seventh year hosting our annual retreat. We typically host our retreats in person and it's a weekend retreat, but just because of the current circumstances, um, we're now hosting everything virtually. So thank you. Thank you everyone and welcome. And next, um, Okay, so next, just wanted to quickly go over our agenda for the day. So we started off with prayer and meditation in the morning at eight, and then we went off and talked about, or did a little bit of active yoga to get the day started, um, and then went on at 11 o'clock to do a little bit of Tibetan language reading session. And now we're here at 2 p.m. Um, talking about the social emotional learning and Buddhist philosophy in relation to mental health. Um, so I want to introduce our two speakers that we have here today. We have Geshe Damdunam Gela, who's here. Um, he's a Geshe Laramba. He's also a published author and translator. Geshe Damdunam's credits include a Tibetan translation of His Holiness the Dalai Lama's Power of Compassion and a language manual, um, Learn English Through Tibetan, in addition to a critical edition of Tsongkhapa's Speech of Gold, among other publications. And then uh, Dr. Lauren Lebner, he's a clinical psychologist who provides uh, individual therapy, diagnostic assessment, and family therapy. He maintains a private practice in Center, Centerville, Virginia, and has over 18 years of experience in psychotherapy. His book, The Lost Art of Compassion, and I think you have one, one other <laughs> book, right, has also been published in several languages. So welcome, Gishla and Dr. Lauren Lebner. And now I'll pass it off to both of you um, to talk a little bit about your work, how we can apply Buddhist psychology and philosophy in cultivating a healthy mind. And then um, maybe in about 40 or 45 minutes, we can open it up to Q&A. I guess you definitely want me to go first? <laughs> yeah, said, please, Doctor, okay. you go first. <laughs> I actually said that earlier, so I was checking. <laughs> but, um, Break well, the path uh, for me, and I can, I can ah. safely walk. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Well, um, first of all, I think it's just, uh, you know, um, thank you for the introduction and, uh, and thank you for your, what you're doing. You know, it's really great preserving. I mean, um, I know it's not an easy task to preserve one's culture um, in the broader context of American society, uh, but the culture you're preserving has a great value, I think, and also the language has a great value. So I really appreciate your effort. Um, and then just, I'll say a few brief comments, I guess, you know, uh, you know, personally, I'm Buddhist, but also I work as a psychologist. So I'll say a few things about that. And I was thinking about, like, in the context of the current um, pandemic, especially, like, there's so much um, mental health effects, actually. You know, there, just yesterday, I was talking to uh, somebody who's an, an expert in that field who was talking about um, that they're already seeing an increase in suicide um, related to the pandemic and other mental health crises, you know, anxiety and depression and many other conditions. And um, so I was actually, I've been mean, thinking, you know, and, and just working with my own patients, I see that, but also then kind of contemplating it in the context of our society. And I thought to mention just a few things, you know, and, and I'll just make one a comment first, actually, as kind of preliminary, is something I was sort of contemplating and talking with younger Tibetans is I was wondering also how much, and this I a more question for you guys that maybe we can talk about later, but I was thinking about like, there are certain issues that are very common in Western society, mental health issues, that I think were not common among older Tibetans. But then if you grew up in an, in, or lived for a long time in the US, I, I sort of thought, oh, I wonder how much of that <laughs> will become subject to because of living in this culture. And then, you know, because there are differences, cultural differences. But of course, when, you're, when you have two different cultural influences or more, then uh, you're influenced by all of them, of course. So, uh, so some of that you'll have to inform me, I guess. But I thought to just say a few things. One is, um, in terms of Western psychology and Buddhist psychology, I thought to say a couple of things. One is about scientific research, because the Holiness Dalai Lama often emphasizes science. And um, a few years ago, actually, somebody asked me to write like an, uh, an article for a, a, a book that they were doing about, about this topic. And so I, I was researching on mindfulness, you know, just the Western scientific research on mindfulness. And this was a few years ago, but at that time, there were about 1,200 
uh, like peer-reviewed scientific research articles on the benefits of mindfulness. Since then, there have become many, many articles also on the benefits of compassion meditation. You know, they're doing research on that at Emory University and at Stanford and now at Yale and many different universities. And so I think one thing I wanted to say is that, you know, a lot of that is, you know, uh, was influenced by Buddhism. Of course, that's where those meditations came from. But now science has shown humongous benefit to those. And um, I remember when I first started in psychology, it was like considered radical to introduce people to meditation. Now everybody is considered strange if you don't introduce people to meditation. Um, and so one thing I wanted to say is, especially during these difficult times, you know, uh, to practice mindfulness regularly is really beneficial. And also to practice loving kindness meditation regularly, because they have different benefits, you know, uh, for us. And so I, one, that was one thing I wanted to say, you know, both from a Buddhist perspective, but also from even from a scientific perspective, it's very clear that that's beneficial. And then in terms of there are many benefits that have been shown from those meditations, decreasing anxiety, uh, less likely to get depressed, uh, dealing better with physical pain, dealing better with stress. You know, the original research on, on mindfulness actually was for people who are caring for loved ones who are dying, right? And showed that when they were, um, even under those extremely stressful circumstances, when they practice mindfulness regularly, it helped decrease even the physiology of their stress. And actually in the current context, I'll even share, they did one study where they had people practice mindfulness regularly, and then they checked their immune function and found that their immune function was quite a bit better and if the people practice mindfulness regularly, like three times a week or more, then um, even if they stopped doing it for a few months, their immune function stayed better. Then it gradually decreased a little bit over time. So there's a lot of health benefits also to mindfulness practice. Of course, that's not in Buddhist context. I mean, reason to do it. But in this context of our world, that's a good thing to do also in that sense. Then um, another, I, I thought, well, you know, I just have a little bit of time. So I thought, what's really important to share? And I thought one thing I wanted to share that is shown well in, in the Western research and that His Holiness Dalai Lama was actually, Dalai Lama was recently mentioning in a talk, I was watching the live stream talks, and he was mentioning the same point actually, because of his dialogue with uh, neurologists and psychologists, is I thought one thing I really wanted to share is, I sometimes say is if, if there's one thing you can learn, like a basic thing about our psychology that science has shown very strongly and that I would really, I tell all my patients, is don't ruminate. Uh, you know, and rumination, is when you think a negative thought, the same pattern of negative thoughts over and over. You know, and, and what, um, you know, and that you just kind of go over them in your mind, right? When people are anxious, then they can be anxious thoughts. When people are depressed, they're sad thoughts. You know, when people are angry, they're angry thoughts. But the scientific research has shown that, I, I sometimes say this, rumination is like, it's like the worst thing you could do for your brain, really. Uh, apart from using uh, maybe drugs, <laughs> that's maybe worse, but apart from serious drugs, I think rumination, the worst thing you can do psychologically for your brain is to ruminate. They've shown that if you ruminate, that can cause an anxiety disorder. People who ruminate, it can cause depression. Um, and so, you know, and so I always say this, that actually each of us should have like a set of techniques, first of all, to recognize we're ruminating. That takes mindfulness, right? So you have to recognize, oh, I'm thinking the same. You know, there's a difference. I always say there's a difference between problem solving, right? Problem solving is where you recognize there's some problem I have to address okay, what am I going to do about it? And you analyze it and you think of a solution. That's not at all the same, right? There's rumination. And, you, and everybody has ruminated sometimes, right? It's like, oh, this person's so bad. Why are they treating me this way? Oh, how could they do that? Oh, it's so terrible they did that. Why did they do that? Over and over, right? Or if you're anxious, right? It's like, oh, this may go wrong. That may go wrong. This other thing may go wrong, you know, and, and so on. But it's this repetitive cycle that's totally useless. And it harms our brain. And it actually, uh, over time, if you do it a lot, it actually changes the um, neurotransmitters in your brain, the balance of them and, and harms you even, even physiologically. And so I always say people should have like a list almost in their mind of how am I gonna stop ruminating? Does that make sense? So first you have to recognize you're ruminating. And I, I sometimes say, you know, there are many different ways to stop ruminating, but, uh, and I sometimes think it's best to start with the best, right? You can have almost a list from the best way to any, so it's still better than ruminating. You know, so a great way, of course, if you're gonna, if you do some, Dharma practice, that's the best way to stop ruminating, right? If you go, you know, meditate on love or meditate on compassion or uh, meditate on uh, Tara or Chinrezik, of course, that's uh, the best way. But, you know, if you can't do that, then if you just focus on the present moment, right? That's better than ruminating. If you can't, if you find yourself that you can't do that, then it's still better to call a friend and talk, right? To ask, reach out for social support, you know, sort of get your mind off it. Uh, if you, you know, if you find that there's nobody to talk to at that moment, 
right, uh, to go do a different activity, shift your attention to something else, you know, um, you know, some task you have to do, but, but again, don't do the task while thinking about the rumination. Does that make sense? So focus on whatever you're doing, do something that op occupies your mind, you know, and I sometimes say if, if that doesn't work, you know, actually, I, I once saw a talk where um, I thought it was the same point, actually, but it made me laugh. It was actually, a, a, it was a transcript of a talk by Trijang Rinpoche, the junior tutor to His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, and he said, if none of those things work, take a nap. You know, and I thought that's also what a Western psychologist would say. Uh, you know, there is to do whatever you can to not waste your time ruminating. And if you can't do something positive, do something neutral. You know, or even if you, if you know, um, you know, again, I said calling a friend, but even if you, you know, watch a comedy, that's better than ruminating, right? If you go listen to a song and then, you know, come back and do something else. But get your mind off the subject that you're ruminating about because it doesn't do any good. It never helps anybody to ruminate. One other strategy I wanted to mention about rumination also is to, um, is to also another way you can do it. That, that was one list of things, right? So all those things I mentioned, but there's one more I wanted to mention, which is confronting the thoughts. In other because oftentimes our ruminations are unrealistic, right? They're distorted, right? Oh, everything can go wrong. Everything's terrible. Or, you know, um, it's hopeless. You know, those kinds of ruminations, right? And, and so another, you know, w one set of strategies are sort of focus on something else. And those were like, you know, whether it be going to do a Dharma practice or focusing on the present moment or doing a different task, calling a friend. But a different type of strategy is actually to recognize the thought and say, that's not realistic. Let me confront that thought. You know, like, so if you're thinking it's hopeless, well, it's never totally hopeless, right? There's always something one can do. You know, if you're thinking everything can go wrong, everything can go wrong, is to say, well, wait a second. You know, not everything always goes wrong. Sometimes things go right. And what can I do and control to make things go a little more right? You know, and, and, um, and so that's another important strategy is to actually confront the thoughts when they're unrealistic and correct yourself, right? Because that's, otherwise you're letting your mind go into a bad habit of thinking unrealistic, distorted thoughts. And whatever you habituate your mind to, your mind will think that. So don't let yourself get in the habit of thinking things that are unrealistic or distorted. Um, so to confront them is very important sometimes. And, um, and I'll say one more thought. This was just something I, as I was thinking about this today, I, I sort of thought a little bit, so I thought just to mention. Uh, one, you know, I was saying the cultural differences. So one, one type of distorted thought, there are many types, right? Like I gave some examples, angry distorted thoughts or hopeless distorted thoughts or worried distorted thoughts. But um, one thing I was thinking about this morning when I was thinking about this, this was, I remember uh, early on in my ex uh, experience of Buddhism and also of Tibetan culture, there was this idea in the West that was very common. Every, it seems like every Westerner knows self-hatred. And then I remember when they would, uh, originally when people would talk to Tibetan lamas about that, including His Holiness the Dalai Lama uh, and other Tibetan lamas, people, every, at the very beginning, every Tibetan lama would say, what are you talking about? There's no such thing. Everybody cherishes themselves, right? Um, and then Westerners say, no, I hate myself. You know, uh, and so, and, and I'll say working with my patients, I can see the truth of that, right? So many uh, Western people you know, think I'm the worst. I'm terrible. I hate myself. You know, I don't deserve to live. I'm a horrible person. Like, like thinking this kind of thing over and over and over, right? And one thing I contemplated is I thought, you know, those, that, that generation of Tibetans from the, like, you know, uh, you know, who lived, who grew up in Tibet, uh, seemed to say that that wasn't part of that, the culture, right? But I thought, oh, I wonder if younger Tibetans have learned self-hatred from Westerners or not. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but for sure, I can say, uh, you know, from my experience as a psychologist, Western, Western people really do do that. Um, and uh, I don't want to take up too much time, so I'll just say one or two other quick thoughts, and then I'll switch. So we can go to Keshe, uh, Keshe But I thought to share, actually, I'll share one, more, one other brief scientific research I just thought was interesting that probably you guys have not, very few, not many people have seen, but I thought it was interesting. They once did, they, you know, for anxiety, right, mindfulness helps with anxiety, but also they found that... Um, the relaxation response, right, which was a, a scientifically discovered thing, right, where you focus on something neutral, right? And so they would focus on the breath, or sometimes they would focus on a phrase, right? Like, um, you know, relax, let go, something like that. Uh, but then somebody actually did a scientific research study where they compared an English phrase, like relax, let go, or something like that, to a mantra. And they said, which is more effective in decreasing anxiety, even if the person wasn't uh, Hindu or Buddhist? And what they found actually was that mantras are more effective. I thought that was really interesting. So in other words, a made up phrase versus a mantra, the mantra works better at decreasing anxiety. Of course, that's not the purpose of mantras, but I thought that was just interesting. And so I thought if you're feeling anxious, 
you know, then it's quite good to say Om Tari Ti Tari Tari Sa or Om Mani Pimi Hum. You know, it, it, you can actually know there's scientific basis for knowing it's actually more effective for decreasing anxiety. And one, the last thing I'll say, and then we'll switch over, is also, so those were, it, it, to me, the, the topics I was just talking about, about not ruminating and ways of, uh, you know, talking to other people or doing mindfulness or saying mantra, or, you know, th those are to regulate our emotions, right? And so one whole category of Western psychological research is how do we regulate our emotions? And I just think even just to ask yourself, well, what do I do to regulate my emotions, right? Because there are some very terrible ways people regulate their emotions. They take, you know, heroin or something like that, right? They drink too much alcohol. That hurts their health and their uh, mind. And then there are healthy ways to regulate our emotions, like meditation or exercise or talking to a friend or um, doing something creative. So one point I was making is in terms of emotional regulation is to just even ask yourself the question, what are my tools? And if you don't know what your tools are, that's a sign you should work on that. Does that make sense? And make sure you have a wide range of tools because in these at any time, but especially in these difficult times, the more tools you have, the better. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention, I just wanted to at least bring up before we stop, is resilience. That's another area of research uh, in psychology is resilience, right? And resilience is particularly about how do we face and, and, and be okay through or even get stronger through difficult times. And I thought, you know, resilience is so important, actually. And actually, I'll just share one brief, uh, I, for some reason today I'm in research. I don't know, I don't usually talk about research this much, but, but I am. But they actually, one time I was at a conference and they were talking about suicide risk, actually. And what they found, I thought this was interesting, was that in America, the people at highest risk of suicide are people like me. In other words, old white men. Uh, old white men don't learn how to be resilient, actually, enough. Uh, you know, they expect, too often white men in America expect everything to be easy. Uh, and so they don't learn to be resilient. And then when they get sick or they have losses, when they get older, they kill themselves actually. And they found the, well, who was the least likely to, uh, to commit suicide were old black women. And I thought, well, that makes sense in American culture, doesn't it? There is if a woman who, uh, a black woman who grew up in America, if she is alive and older has learned to deal with challenges. Uh, because American culture is not an easy place for, uh, because of racism. But my point is, is that for each of us, we should also ask the question, I think, it's a good question to ask, you know, how do I cultivate resilience, right? And part of, as briefly, part of resilience is how do I find meaning in difficult times, right? What can I learn from these difficult times? Not viewing them as like bad, but saying, well, difficult times come to everybody, right? And what are the lessons to learn when difficulties arise? Of course, the Tibetan Buddhist Lojong teachings uh, teach so much about that. But, you know, to ask, well, do I apply those when hard things happen to me? You know, and which of those do I apply? And how do I apply them? And then the other is to focus on, like, what can I control? You know, because during difficult times, there's things you can't control. But to focus on, well, what can I control? For example, one's own thoughts, right? One's own attention, one's own act behaviors. You know, but, and then, and also to find what can I do that's constructive, you know, especially if somebody like loses their job or loses some, you know, we can lose all kinds, we can lose somebody we love, we can lose things, but to say, well, what, what can I do now that's constructive, you know, because part of resilience is not only focusing on, of course, giving yourself space to feel your feelings about the bad thing and say, okay, I feel sad or I feel upset, that's normal, right? But then to say, okay, but then uh, based on this, I'll, I'll, let, maybe I'll just stop with this last thing. Because I think about, I've worked with a lot of people, like for example, parents who've lost children or other people who've gone through terrible losses. One thing that always strikes me is there comes a point for some people, like there's a point of despair and deep pain, right? But I've always noticed this, that the, oftentimes the time where things shift is that they can't bring back, you know, what they cannot control is they can't bring back somebody, right? But then they focus, when they start to focus on, well, how am I going to make this meaningful? You know, I think of one parent where it was planting a tree in honor of their child in New York City in the Central Park, or somebody else that was starting a foundation, uh, you know, to help other young people who are going through the same problem that, that their child. And I just thought, wow, even in that circumstance, it's when the person starts to find meaning and focus on what can I control, that they start to feel better a little bit. Not even feel better is maybe the wrong word, but that they start to find their resilience, maybe is a great way to say it. And so I think for all of us, when we go through difficult times, it's good to ask ourselves, you know, we could say in general, if we're Buddhist, of course, the Lojong teachings are there, but, but how do I apply those? What is my personal sense of purpose? What do I want to focus on to control, you know, uh, to make things better in the world? And how do I, what, you know, what do I personally learn from difficult experiences 
to find meaning in them. And to, um, yeah, and, th and that, that brings about some resilience. I don't want to take up too much time because I want to let Geshe have time, but we can do a question and answer after, so yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Latner. Yeah. Thank you. I think you touched on so many important points that needed to be touched. Oh. And uh, uh, I echo all of those, uh, particularly rooted in your uh, profession of dealing with uh, people with uh, problems, uh, these messages that you bring up. Uh, bring out are uh, very uh, pra practically rooted and have shown their uh, efficaciousness in real life. So that's very important for uh, youngsters to know and notice. And uh, so for my part, I'll just share a few things. Uh, I want to start with a Native American story where there is said to be, I mean, many of you may have already heard, there's this grand with the grandson taking a walk in the woods. And then the grandpa was sharing a story saying, we all have two wolves within us. Ring a bell? Yes, maybe. <laughs> we all have two wolves within us. Yeah, right. And they are always at fight with each other. Uh, and one wolf represents uh, the negative aspects of us in terms of thinking, doing, whatnot, whereas the other one uh, represents the good part of us, uh, good potentials, because the positive potentials within us and the actions that we do for others, uh, at the very least uh, in restraining, harming others, or if possible, even making the step further in reaching out and helping out, all of those are represented by the other wolf. But these two wolves are always at fine. And as the story was progressing, uh, the grandchild kind of took time to ask grandpa, grandpa, who wins the fight in the final? And the grandpa says, whoever you feed, whoever you feed, the, whoever you feed of the two bulbs within you, that will win. Now, uh, that's very true of us. We have the choice to feed both of them, either of them, none of them, <laughs> we have the choice. We are free to do that. We are free in so many ways. We may claim that, oh, I'm not free in, in having things done, but at the very least, we are free to free ourselves. We may find ourselves wound in uh, and trapped in several things and whatnot, but particularly the thought processes that we think like, I can't get out of this. This, if we look very carefully, this is something that we have ourselves voluntarily wound around ourselves. Now it lies on us to recognize that and then unwind it. We are free to do that. So this, this story is very telling. And even in Tibetan culture also, I don't know how much it is uh, rooted in the scriptures as such, but uh, in the folklore, we, you do speak of we, we all have a devil and angel born with us. Each person has a lande, a devil, and la, and de, la, angel, and de, a demon, born with us. It's almost like we are walking like a three person, and whoever we listen to, whoever we kind of pay our attention to, that's what we become, more of it. So this part we need to recognize on ourselves, that the, the truth of that. We have to recognize this in ourselves and then try to assert our freedom in choosing who we want to listen to, who we want to feed among the two wolves. So uh, this part needs to be recognized, understood, realized, and then practically kind of borne out through one's own little steps when situations present themselves unto us. So this is very important. Now, along with that, in Buddhism, you may have, heard, you have noticed and heard from many people how, how much it pays attention on knowing oneself. Knowing oneself to the extent of seeing that there is no self. <laughs> that we have been so kind of, what do you call, uh, uh, obsessively clinging on to. 
Uh, so none, none, nonetheless, knowing oneself, knowing who oneself is, and thus uh, succeeding in managing oneself, we all claim want to be successful in our life, to be a CEO or one thing, another company, whatnot. But in the in the midst of that, we forget about our own company <laughs> and leave that unattended to. First and foremost, to do good in anything that we aim to in life for others, for others, with others, has to begin with first being a good manager of oneself, be a CEO of oneself. Right? And in that, the first requirement is knowing who oneself is, be that one's own weaknesses, one's own uh, positive qualities, uh, one's own perspectives, one's own outlooks, be that the innate ones or the cultivated ones do have a say in do have a say in recognizing them and having a, a, a true uh, talk conversation with them don't believe all of them it may sound a little different but sound a little weird but i want to say don't believe everything that you think <laughs> in a way don't believe yourself <laughs> necessarily yeah have a choice assert yourself out of them and say, yes, this is what I want to listen to. This is not what I want to listen to. And in this, in this, there is this very important part of knowing oneself, who oneself is. And this could be stretched uh, uh, long. I mean, we could come up with a range of things about knowing ourselves, uh, to the most simple one, to the radical one, what not, even from a Buddhist perspective. But uh, one thing uh, is to always kind of uh, put a question mark on who you think you are. I, I remember very clearly in one of William James' writings, he speaks of how whenever there is, when, whenever there are two people speaking, there are actually six people involved. <laughs> the I of you, the I that you think you are, the I that the other person think you are, and then the I there is, that you are you. <laughs> and likewise, the same case from the other side. So in a way, there are six people involved there. He's being generous. He, he's being kind of conservative in saying just six. There could be so many involved there, right? So not everyone can be true in, 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 in thinking who they are in this. And thus there is this need of really doing a thorough check on who oneself is. And uh, I'm not prescribing kind of think, think this way or that way, but at the very least have this freedom in choosing and testing and kind of testing it out for oneself in kind of getting progressively more realistic understanding of who oneself is. And that can be then eventually extended to others. Begin with the self-awareness. Self-awareness and then maybe knowing what you want that you don't get, uh, right? Knowing uh, how oneself kind of put oneself into trouble unnecessarily, what not. Try to generate some sense of care, genuine care, love towards oneself. And also know what would loving oneself in a genuine sense look like. Not just going about the motion of loving and doing just about anything, anything that one is loving oneself, which is not necessarily what it turns out to be. So there's this need of kind of knowing oneself generating a sense of genuine sense of care, uh, taking into account the embedded aspiration for anything joyful, happy, happiness, anything pleasant we aspire for ourselves. Nothing wrong with that. And, but at the same time, uh, at the same time, be very uh, resourceful, re realistic in knowing what really matches with that aspiration. What does not? And try to kind of prove that out on oneself. So that's self-care. Self-care in a genuine sense. Nothing wrong with self-care in this, in this way. Nothing wrong with selfishness in this sense. If one is selfish and makes effort in really knowing what, ta what it takes to be happy, what it takes to be uh, joyful, successful in the true sense, and one kind of then employs that and one oneself, even confined to oneself, that's fine. 
that kind of a selfishness I call the first step of why selfishness. Then the next one would be to get, kind of make the, uh, make the next try in reaching out to others, making them part of you. And that would be even wiser selfishness. But start out with the wise selfishness where you know the, the causal link, the causal link to what brings about genuine help, genuine benefit, genuine joy. Then kind of then assert the freedom in choosing what you want to, which, which wolf you want to feed, which wolf you don't want to feed. What thought you want to listen to, what thought you don't want to listen to. At least sometimes you could even give it a try saying, oh, what does it look like paying attention to this? And then know it for yourself that this is not the right thing to do. So through that, kind of, kind of understand uh, what's the best for oneself. Kind of knowing the, the causal relationship between what leads to what, particularly in terms of what leads to genuine joy, happiness, meaning, purpose. And then kind of deliver on that for oneself. That genuine care. That's genuine care. And then from that, one will be able to kind of really regulate oneself, manage oneself vis-a-vis -vis others. And also that put, provide the room, space, to, if one cares, to eventually extend that out to others and expect a similar satisfying, uh, fulfilling result. So one has to begin with knowing oneself. So this, I think, uh, is very important. Uh, and uh, in this regard, then if you look into the resources, if you listen to others, then you will begin to see what are the elements, what are the tools that you need to gather. Earlier, Dr. Ladner was speaking about kind of building the resources, building the tools. So build your own, build your own well-being tool, <laughs> which would include mindfulness, mental introspection, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But build your own well-being tool in terms of uh, what are there laid out, what works with you, what works better for you, kind of then kind of have this resource at hand in going. Uh, in going for when one is uh, in in need of it. So in among those among those tools, I, I can I will mention one two of them. One is uh, to really take the freedom uh, in in thinking more along the lines of how similar we are, not along the ways of how we differ. And then see how fundamental are the similarities. From a Buddhist perspective, we always speak of the common humanity, although the common humanity term, the term common humanity is very vague. People kind of kind of extend it here and there and put it, put their own meaning. What I actually mean here is how we are same in a very, very basic fundamental sense in aspiring for happiness, not wanting suffering. So in a way, that is not just about common humanity, common sentient being, whatever you may call it. It's something that cuts across all uh, kinds of sentient beings. But uh, definitely that's something that humanity as a whole commonly shares. We share in our hopes, we share in our worries, we share in our fears, aspirations, dreams. Think more along those lines of how fundamentally we are similar. And then if we could kind of think more along those lines, then he will begin, begin to be clear that even the differences, more so in, 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 in our choices, in our thoughts, in our uh, methods, will begin to see grounded in those same similarities. So they will be expressions of those similarities. There will be not something about differences, but rather similarities being affirmed 
in those differences. So when we begin to see the differences in a different light, in the light of being similar, so the more similar we think of others, we will see how our whole, whole way of thinking relating to others, our own speech, our own actions will be affected in the positive sense by this. These days, even science backs this up by doing many exper experiments, including those of uh, that of one where they make someone wear the jersey of a, of, of, of a uh, football team, whatever, and then begin to see how people react differently by seeing someone wearing the jersey of that team or not, et cetera, et cetera. Even if the person is in the same situation, what not? We do not have to rely on such trivial temporary similarities. They are deep down entrenched within us similarities that we carry with us everywhere, in all situations. Even in our worst actions, we begin to see how deep down it is rooted in the similarities. So begin to dwell more on the similarities. And then the other aspect is how dependent we are. how dependent we are. We can be dependent and can be, what do you call, uh, benefiting of, of others' abnormalities, others' difficulties, others' problems, if only we care to look at it from that point of view. In this regard, I think William James says that the study of abnormal is the best way to understand what is normal. So when people present themselves in their worst, it's like they are presenting us with a lesson that would go long in our life at their own expense without our having to go through that problem, but leaving the benefit to ourselves. So this is, so in terms of how things turn out to be, we don't have much control. But in terms of how that will affect us, we have much more freedom, much more say, much more room than we may have imagined. In terms of how we see, that's totally coming from us. And then from through that, how we experience, it's to a great extent coming from our own projection, our own way of relating to situations. There we have more say than we could ask for. So these are something that are really factual things, but needs to be confirmed on one's own efforts, on one's own tests, and then build on that one step at a time. And then if we, if we do so, then we will begin to see how even situations of crisis, emergencies, as hard as they are, do not necessarily have to be that bad in affecting us adversely. In fact, they could be turned around and could be the biggest boon in our life. In really, what do you call, in really, making us encounter our own immense positive potentials. So we could go on and on and on like this and uh, in, 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 in the present uh, day, as uh, Dr. Ladner was mentioning, how uh, science uh, has uh, embraced the practices of mindfulness, empathy, love, compassion, not because of their moral ideal stature, but because of their practical benefits. So much so that they have now come to use such slogans as train your mind, change your brain. So, so we just have to generate this interest and then uh, make our 
efforts in kind of uh, gathering them and then more importantly, putting them into practice and, re and, and, and realizing for ourselves the efficaciousness of them. And, and that's become a living example of those benefits for oneself to benefit from and also for others to learn from. We, if we kind of bring, build the living experience of this, then, then it's like we can be confident in really facing situations, whatever they may be, in being very confident that no matter what they may be, but in terms of the inner world, that is crucial in making me experience and feel what I feel. In there, I have more say that I can turn everything around. So with this, uh, I want to stop here and then maybe we could open the floor for discussions. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gishla. Thank you, Dr. Ladner. We actually already have a few questions that have come through in the chat. So I'll read the first one. Um, it's from Jamba Shapala. So she mention, mentions that she's been teaching very basic dharma to her local Tibetan kids from ages 6 to 16 for the last four months. So one of the last topics that she's covered is on the nature of mind, um, as she thinks that it's one of the most important things. And any, with anything we do on a daily basis, we're constantly thinking first, and there are many types of emotions that come. Um, so she says, you know, we discussed a little bit about right motivations and right intentions in our thoughts when helping others. So if Dr. Ladner could comment on this a little or elaborate on the subject a little bit more. And I think Gishla, you touched on this as well um, in terms of like being wise, selfish. So if you could also kind of follow up with a little bit. So Dr. Ladner. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to make sure I get it. Like the, the, so the, the topic is sort of right motivations. Yes, yeah, on motivation. Motivations and intention. That's an interesting question. I guess, you know, because one thing that's like occurring to me, I'm just going to connect it for a moment to what Geshe said, is like, I actually think most people, you know, like, I mean, of course, if somebody's practicing Buddhism very intensely, it's different. But for most people, like, I think most people don't even know what their intentions are. Do they? Like, in other words, how often do people say, like, if you look actually in just normal society, like, and even like, if I think of like, when I meet together with people who aren't really practicing, you know, or even like, actually, many people, they never even ask themselves that question. Like, what's my intention? What's my motivation for my life, actually? Like, and I, I, because I'm Buddhist, oftentimes, like, I'm shocked. I mean, now I'm used to it, I guess, somewhat. But I like, I meet with patients, and sometimes this person's like, you know, a person in their 30s or 40s or you know and I say well what's what's the purpose of life to you what matters to you what are your values and they say oh, like and nobody ever I never thought about that and so I actually think the first step in a way is even for a person to and I think uh, Jampa it's really great that you're doing that for young people Jampa is an old friend actually um, <laughs> really good to see you but um, you know like for young people to have somebody to actually help them even start to ask that question because it's terrible, isn't it? Like, and I, I shall just say, I'll say one more point. Like, actually, I can think of some, I've seen so many patients like this, people who like, they got like, um, you know, they even like went through school, they went through high school, they went through college, maybe they got a graduate degree, they have a job, and then like, they have children or something. And then for the first time, they say, what's the purpose of my life? What, what's my intention? What really matters to me? And I think, my goodness, it's so late. And, you know, like, then if you have the wrong job and the wrong, you know, and you married the wrong person and you, have built a family on the wrong basis, you know, and then that other partner thinks, oh, my life is supposed to be this way. That's what you told me we're doing. Then suddenly it's like, oh, wow, you know, it's really hard to change it, you know. So I actually think it's so useful to ask, like, to work with young people and help them just think, like, what is my intention, actually? What do I, what, what really matters in life, you know, what, and, um, and to ask that question deeply, you know, first of all, like, because one is they may never ask it. The other is, like, to ask them, you know, because of course, if whatever the culture is, then they may have some idea from that culture. But also if you're from very, you know, in America, there are all kinds of crazy inputs actually, right? you know, about what's important, right? Like it could be winning. It could be what sports team, you know, some, I know some people like they think the most important thing is what sports team wins, uh, you know, if their team won this, you know, the game or something like, but to actually ask them to think deeply, like what really matters to you, you know, and, and even like, and to think that deeply enough so that you want to live your life that way, 
then I think they can get to what's my motivation. You know, so like, then I think that that question of motivation is like, well, are you living that way? Then they can start to ask. And, and I'll just share, share this actually, because it's very touching to me sometimes. I, like I'm working sometimes with many, I do that with almost every patient now. Like I'll ask them, what matters to you? What are your values? What, and most of them don't know. Then once they know, or if they do know somewhat, like they don't live their lives that way. You know, if they say one thing, then I say, well, but you told me what you do every morning, every afternoon, every evening, on the weekends. And almost none of that is what you value. What do you like? So that's not really either. That's not what you value or you're not living the right way. Which is it, you know? But that's where I think then the question that John Bala raised is really so useful, isn't it? Because once the person knows these are my values, then they can say, well, am I living according to my intention? Is my intention in accordance with my values? You know, if my value, if I say my value is um, to be of service, but then I'm not doing activities like that, you know, then that's not, you know, and, and so, and then also, I think one last point I'll make is, and it's in line with what Geshe said, is that then also you have to know yourself, right? Because how many times also do we have like, where we say, oh, you know, my motivate, oh, you know, I'm doing, even if you, so first thing is, if you don't know what your values are, then you can't do it. Second is, you ask the question, am I living my values? But then the third point is self-awareness, like Geshe was mentioning. Because sometimes people, right, they think they're doing something for one reason. And, and actually, I'll share that too. I can think of some people I've worked with. Like, I remember one guy I worked with, he had spent his whole life, he had like done, you know, from an I live, I work outside of Washington, D.C. And he was like, in, had been very high up in the federal government and had done many big projects and been somewhat famous, you know. And then he was getting ready to retire. And he said, I've never done anything yet that mattered to me. And I said, but you, you know, there's this list, you know, the list of things you did. You know, and he said, you know, I just did those because like, I was important. And it seemed like I was important. And he said, but none of that was actually important to me in my heart. You know, I did these big projects and it was famous. And he said, but actually I'm a failure, you know, because even though I succeeded at these external projects, they weren't what mattered in life. And I focused on the wrong thing. So he hadn't been honest with himself. He didn't know himself, right? He, and all those years and he never thought, what's my real motivation when I go to this big meeting? And then when he was actually asked himself that question deeply and knew himself, he said, it was just, I was showing off, you know, that's a waste of my life, you know? And so then I said, well, let's not do that anymore. You know, like, even though he was older, it was like, well, there's still time. Now's the time to focus on what matters. What's your intention? And then he started asking that question deeply that John was reading. What's my intention when I go do this? And then it became a positive intention for him. And he felt better, actually. It's interesting, isn't it? Even though he had these big achievements, he felt empty. But then when he started doing things that in his heart were correct motivation for him, according to his values, then he started to feel better. So I think it's great to ask young people and to really think those questions very deeply. And I think those three points though, even to know what your values are, then to ask, am I living them? But then to be honest with yourself, am I really living them or am I just doing some fake version of living them? So I think that's really so good. And it's a great, huge gift to those people, I think. And actually, I'll, I'll say this too. I actually think it's a gift, even if you're not teaching a class, like for everybody, to ask a friend that, to ask yourself that, to ask somebody in your family that. No, you know, like sometimes there are people, nobody ever asked them that. Just this week I met a guy. He said, nobody ever asked me that question in my whole life. You know, nobody ever cared. You know, that wasn't the question. Um, so just to ask a friend that question is such a gift, isn't it? Because otherwise the person may never ask themselves. Yeah, I went on and on. <laughs> so, uh, Chimela, did, did you want me to touch on this or I think Dr. Luck covered a lot. Okay, so uh, I'm just, if you have something you'd like to add, um, certainly, uh, but okay. I can also move on to the next. <laughs> yeah, in this, uh, in this regard, uh, to a great extent, uh, it will depend on what a person is comfortable with in terms of his or her worldview his or her worldview is uh, what and how far uh, their how far uh, uh, how far their range of thinking goes in terms of existence and whatnot uh, although at at very very young age it may not be that that uh, different uh, among them but um, but uh, one thing uh, uh, to emphasize is to live one's life in such a way that uh, one leaves more positive things than more mess. <laughs> and 
in that that um, that could look in the actual world it could look uh, that could take different forms but uh, what in essence that is is in how one approaches things with what kind of a mentality one does it and there irrespective of whether one is very clear about what one's actual intention motivation in life is or not at that very particular given instance of one's life if one does that with a sense of care or at the very least with a restraint against harming others if you touch everything that you do that you say with if at with, with at least a restraint against harm if possible with a small touch of altruism small touch of helping someone then that moment would be well lived i remember i remember uh, a story that went around a few months ago around a young girl called Lexi who died at age 11 mm-hmm. from an, a car accident but uh, I mean, unfortunately but then before that she was very busy in making masks and uh, distributing it to people she was uh, very instrumental in having her family mobilized around her vision and she succeeded in really distributing hundreds of uh, masks at that age. And when she met with that tragic accident, people were very, very moved and touched. And we also kind of awakened to how a life too short, even if it is too short, could be lived meaningfully. And after there was a slogan saying live Live like Lexi. Live life like Lexi. Mm-hmm. So that's uh, my input on how life as a whole or a particular moment in life uh, could be lived mm-hmm. meaningfully, and then that adds up to bigger meaning. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you Thank you, Dr. Ladner. Um, another question we have from Kermit Sidin La, and if I'm not um, explaining it well, you know, if you could just unmute yourself and ask the question too. I think the question is surrounding um, the use of terminology and labeling. So her question um, to both Gishla and Dr. Ladner is, what are your thoughts and perspectives on emotions, um, labeling them? So, so such as like examples include sad, irritable, anger. Do you believe that these emotions are acceptable? Do you want to go first this time? I would... <laughs> okay, the, here, here, I, I would go first. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this question really uh, brought up an important lesson that I was thinking of touching on to make a difference in each and every one of our life, which is developing emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence as well as do you say coordination, cognitive, coordination intelligence? We are primarily, we are primarily, unlike other things, we are primarily animate things. We are organic, not inorganic. We are living, not non-living. And then from among living, we are sentient, not non-sentient. So, What makes us special among them is because of our sentient, our capacity for thinking, experiencing, feeling, uh, etc. So, so, so mainly the affective component, the emotions, and then the cognitive components or the cognitive components, our perspectives, outlooks, whatnot, they play a crucial role in shaping our life. We need to kind of own up. Uh, we need to take charge of them, own up to them, and also have increasing say in in how to how to eff- how to influence them, how to affect them. So there's this need of really knowing ourselves well, and that may that may take primarily a form of knowing our inner world well. So building on emotional intelligence, which includes leveling the emotions, try to say, this happened today, this happened today, this happened today. If we could do that correctly, we'll be closer to knowing what might have gone wrong to trigger that in the first place. 
But at the same time, we should be very careful not to label something as bad and good, but knowing for what something is as, as it is. So saying that this is a bad emotion, this is a good emotion, uh, maybe, maybe not work at all levels. A certain level we may be accepting to that. Then we can employ that and kind of let that be, let that recognition be even a added stimulus to kind of work towards, to kind of, what do you call, gravitate towards the so-called good emotions, whatnot. But at the very least, we can know them for what they are and then see what, how destructive they are, how constructive they are on a practical level. And if something is mixed in being constructive, then destructive, at least kind of sort it out and saying, in this way it is destructive, in this way it is constructive. And then, and then make our move, our next move in kind of dealing with it, handling with it. So labeling them almost, um, although correctly, is very important. And, and then knowing the ins and outs of it in terms of these emotions are not, what do you call, uh, unitary, f a, a single unit. They are composed of so many aspects of them. And then see from among those aspects, what is more crucial in making it that way? What could be changed? What could be, uh, what do you call, moderated? Uh, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that takes first naming them, knowing them for what they are. And of course, correctly, one has to do a good job. And, and then uh, kind of dealing with them uh, appropriately in terms of how, how destructive they are, how, in, how constructive they are. And even different situations, they can be contextual. In some contexts, they could be good. And then in, in the context of who you are in terms of your ability to deal with them, again, the classification of uh, what could be, what could be uh, cultivated and not may also change. But at the least, uh, knowing, what for, knowing them for what they are, the basic sense in their components, it's very important. So that's the reason why His Holiness the Dalai Lama has been making this call for long to create a map of mind. And within that, the map of emotions, map of perspectives, outlooks, attitudes, get to know ourselves better in terms of what our inner world is composed of what could be brought in, what could be undermined, et cetera, et cetera. What could be made less assertive, what could be brought to the upfront. Those we will be able to do if we know the inner world better. And the first step in that regard is naming them differently. Thank you. <laughs> I, th I thought what Keshele said was very good. I, I, mean, I don't have a lot to add. I will, I'll say only two small comments because I, I really agree very much. One is I just shared, it's just interesting. There are actually some, there's some mental, mental health issues where people are not actually able to name their emotion. And it's a real problem, actually. There are some people who like their brain isn't able to do it, actually. And that actually, it, it leads to social problems and, and other problems. So it's actually, you know, an extreme version there is, it exists actually, uh, where a person actually can't identify their own emotional experience. And it's not helpful at all. So it is good to be able to, to label our emotions. I agree with what Ketchup was saying. And one la and everything he said, I agree with. So I'll just add one small other point, which is just um, that it's also interesting to notice, because what, what Gesha said about the components of emotion, I think also can be useful to notice what are my cognitions, like my thoughts in relation to emotion? What is my physiology? Because our body reacts differently in different emotions. Of course, you know that anger is different than um, attachment, which is different than compassion. You know, you feel different in your body. And then also, what's my behavior? You know, how do I act? And then, you know, His uh, Holiness Lama and Paul Ekman have written books on facial expression, actually. That it causes, you know, even if you don't, I'm saying in the body, right, they, uh, Paul Ekman is a scientific researcher who showed, even if you don't want to, it shows on your face certain emotions. And you can actually read people's faces. There's a, you know, he, he actually trains, um, what do you call it, uh, investigators from the CIA and the FBI, because <laughs> you can't control your face, actually, when you feel emotion. <laughs> but um, we can't either, you know, it comes across and other people feel it. So there are many ways in which actually our emotions affect ourselves and then others. And so noticing those components though, our thoughts, our behavior, our physiology and our body, uh, it helps us know the emotions better.
Nice, thank you. Uh, I'm doing all that while trying to smile and nod my head. <laughs> um, so we have another question from Baekhyun. She's asking, so as a result of the global pandemic, there has been a rise of mental health issues, um, especially in the youth population, as was mentioned earlier. As an educator, how can we help others without getting too burned out ourselves? How can we keep a balance with our own mental well-being while still helping others? Do you want to go first or should I? Oh, this time you should go first. Uh, <laughs> I went first. Of, uh, the other time. <laughs> I have a few thoughts on that just from actually from my work, really. A few points, a couple of different points. One is, I think, um, I've been noticing this. I've been saying I work with some teachers, actually, some people who work in schools and, um, and, and people in other helping professions. And one thing I've noticed lately is most, not everybody, but the vast majority of people during the pandemic have at least times where they can't do as much as they were able before. You know, like it's just because things are different and because it's a stressful time and because our, you know, even if you're doing well, still you're, we're human beings, you know, and we're in a time where things are changed and our body's adjusting to just different routines and everything like that. So one point I would say is we may have to accept that we can't do as much right now as we did other times and that's okay. You know, that's one point. Uh, so self-care in that sense. And then I guess I want to share another point though, which is like, especially when helping children, as you were saying, like, I actually think, you know, going back to the emotional regulation. So one is, I would say two points. One is taking good care of yourself is really important for taking care of children. You know, because as I said earlier, you can't control it, right? If you're not taking care of yourself, your own stress and your own feeling comes across in your face, in your tone of voice, in your body. And then the children feel that and then even if you think oh, I'm trying to help them, they actually feel, oh, she's stressed out or he's stressed out. And then they feel more stressed out. Whereas if you're taking care of yourself, you know, then first of all, you're modeling that. Secondly, then it comes across in your nonverbal communication and then they feel more peaceful. And the third thing I was gonna say, next thing I was gonna say also is, you know, the part of taking care also then is to do, so one is to take care of yourself when you're not working, of course, uh, you know, by doing all the things we talked about today. But another one is even with the children, sometimes I would encourage you to consider at least if it's, if it's appropriate, depending on the context, to actually do things with them then that are soothing. You know, like, in other words, you know, there may come times where they have to talk about difficult topics and that's okay. You know, if somebody is going through a very painful thing, they may have to share that and that's of course important. But, but sometimes they you know, to do some mindfulness together or to do something to lighten things up or to do things, you know, just to show them, well, how do we regulate our emotions? Let's do it now. You know, you're teaching emotional intelligence by actually doing it. And I'll say that like sometimes I'll, I know like with, um, uh, you know, I work, with, I work with children sometimes, you know, and if somebody's overwhelmed, sometimes the most helpful thing is to say, well, let's right now do something that actually makes you feel less overwhelmed. But one thing that'll happen is if they feel less overwhelmed, you'll also feel less overwhelmed. The other students will feel less overwhelmed. And then that becomes a positive, experience right where and then to actually stop one the last thing i'll say about it is then it's good to stop at the end and say notice how you feel now remember before you were feeling so overwhelmed now we did some of this activity you know, we talked about this or we did some meditation or we did a game or something now notice how you feel you feel better well you can do that at home you can do that other times now you know how to do it you know and that's helping them more sometimes than something that feels heavy does that make sense so i always think that with children especially sometimes it's really helpful you know, I used to do, now I don't do it as much, but play, well, I can't do it on the online, but uh, play therapy even, and art therapy. So, you know, activities that sort of lighten things actually make it easier, you know, and, and, um, and the children need that. So I think if they're dealing with the stress of the pandemic, is actually to show them in the moment, how do you take care of yourself in this moment? And by taking care of them, you're also taking care of yourself. And by taking care of yourself, you're taking care of them anyway. Yeah, I think... Uh... Dr. La touched on uh, so many important uh, points. Again, uh, particularly coming from your practical uh, involvement uh, with people with these uh, kind of problems. Uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, we have to be, one, ha one habit, I mean, I think many of you may have already built this. One habit that we may want to pay attention to and build is to have our mind on our mind. Here in Georgia, we have a Georgia state song by the title of Georgia on my mind. <laughs> That's fine to have Georgia on, my, on, on our mind as Georgians, 
we could do the same for any, every, everywhere we are, but we would do better. We would become better Georgians, better citizens or whatnot, if we could have our mind on our mind, <laughs> my mind on my mind. This is so important. Build that habit to come to our mind very uh, naturally. And then not just merely watch there what's happening, but try to, or, what do you call, take charge of it in terms of, again, doing the sorting of what is, what is problematic, what is making, what is adding to the problem, or what, what is lacking there. And again, in terms of whether one succeeds in doing a good job or not, depends on how much of a resource one has built in terms of what to choose from. So build one's mindfulness tool or well-being tool in terms of what are the things that could be done in such situations. Be that in terms of thinking, be that in terms of activity. Very open with children, activity will be the most handy way to uh, have their attention diverted to a positive relaxing situation. There can be so many activities uh, like, like there is this, they make them lie down on their back and then have a uh, keep uh, what, uh, uh, but what do you call, mm, uh, stuffed animal on their belly and then watch it go up and down even with their eyes open, say, oh, it's going up, down, up, down, up, down and then feel the sensations, whatnot. And those could be done. And then there's this another activity. I'm just naming a few. One is called mirroring, mirroring, where you mirror what the other person is doing. And you just really let go of who you are, what you want to do, but rather just do what the other one is doing. And totally giving, giving in to that, letting go of, of this I and me and my preference, kind of just following somebody doing maybe silly things, what not, but uh, with objectively. So there can be so many such activities that could be done. And then, and then a very, very easy way is to uh, bring our attention on the breath. And there are so many different ways of doing breathing exercises. Oh, so many way, different ways of breathing that you pay attention to. Be that long breaths for 10, 12 rounds, medium one, short one, uh, and then pay attention to a sector, et cetera. So, so yeah, so, so build this habit of coming to your mind every once in a while, and then know that what you're doing, if you're really being uh, caught up in, in worrying whatnot, uh, teach yourself this is what you're doing and this is not good. I think in, in, in just as we hear that in Junju, in Shantideva's text, where he says, why do you worry in a particular given situation, right? If, if there is something that you can do, just do it. Instead of spending, uh, wasting your time in worrying. If there's nothing you can do, why worry? Where would that lead you to? What benefit is there? And then William James says that. If you think that worrying too much is going to solve your problem, then you better know that you must belong to another planet. <laughs> he says that. And then he says that, yes, in terms of dealing with the situation, the first step is acceptance. Yes, this is the problem I have. When you say, this is the problem, I am not the problem, but this is the problem, right then and there, you develop a distance between you and the problem. Now you have a better chance in dealing with it objectively, knowing it better and dealing with it. You have already distanced yourself. You may be going through the problem, but the problem is just one part of what you're going through, but not you as a whole. And then deal with it, not deny it. Acknowledge it, know it for what it is, and then be very watchful not to add to the problem with your own projections. Oh, I'm reminded of this, uh, of this example where an, an expert artist, we are all artists of our own life, right? So an expert artist is there who is drawing picture, a, a portrait, and he ended up drawing a portrait of a ghost. An expert as he is, he really did a wonderful job after he has done it. He's now scared of his own work. That's exactly what happens with the problems. We may have a problem there, we, can, we will never be 
rid of problems. There will always be problems, what you call challenge, whatever you call, they will always be there. But how we project, how we deal with it is what really matters. Very often we succumb to our own impulses. Now impulse, instinct is another part of us that we may not have knowingly, willingly, consciously contributed to, but somehow it has become part of us, but we have to deal with it. So recognize them, that they are there in you. And then also have a conscious relationship with them in terms of not listening to them, not paying attention to them, in terms of acknowledging, knowing that they are there, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. So, so that way, at the very least, we would keep ourselves from adding to the problem. Very, very often, it is not the problem, the rather the aversion or the projection that is the problem. Like, like the saying goes, it's not, it's not something that we are afraid of. We are afraid of the fear itself, something like that. So in all of these, we have to make effort. If we make effort, even if it's a small one, because it has been made, it has been brought into existence, it would play its role. It would affect, it would bring a change. And then with the afflictions, with the emotions, afflictions, whatnot, one thing good about them is, instead of just doing nothing against them, if we take even a small step, they will get affected. That is for sure. Like here again, William James says that I sing not because I'm happy, but I am happy because I think. Action may not lead to happiness, but there cannot be happiness without action. Which is to say that things that we aspire, that we want change for the better or whatnot, will come with an action. There is a saying in Tibetan, which is a catchy saying, where it says, every Literally translated, it means everything is in the mouth of Tete, but in English, it should be everything is in the hand of Tete. Tete means making a move, not, not doing, just doing nothing, but making a move will begin to change things. Everything is in the hands of effort. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So I think that kind of covered uh, Tsingchir and your question about how to deal with burnout on a mental level. Ra. So next, uh, well, then you had what you had, because uh, I raised your hand earlier. Do you want to unmute? Uh, sure. Uh, so uh, Dr. Lorne Latner and Geshe Damdula, thank you so much for sharing your time. Um, my question, I think it might be a little unrelated to the topic, but I was just wondering, the term trauma, like how much of what, how society, um, you know, the definition of what's considered a trauma affects it. Because I feel like for many of us are personally like being born and raised in, you know, in Nepal and like in schools, you know, we would beating students is considered normal. And I think in some cases, like, you, you know, the students feel like they deserve it too. And I think, I, I don't think that affected me personally, but coming here and when you retell that story to, you know, your American friends, like they kind of see, like they pity you and like they make you seem like a victim of something. And then that, when you have that um, social aspect included in it, then you think that, oh, you might've been traumatized. And then that kind of brings your um, like mental health a little lower too. So I'm wondering how much of like what society decides like what's normal or what's trauma you know like how does that affect in what you personally believe thank you Trisha, it's up to you do you want to go or first or should i <laughs> okay <Always you>, <laughs> so, some somehow interestingly this question reminded me of the madamika <laughs> where we speak of designation not just designation, that everything is mere designation. <laughs> but there's a danger of misunderstanding it uh, to, to thinking that oh, all that counts is just how we call it. That mere labeling is enough to make anything what it is. 
That's not the case. We, in, in pursuing a Madhyamika understanding, we make this distinction very clearly that everything that is existing is mere, a mere designation, but whatever you designate doesn't necessarily become it. So I, I just wanted to throw that out there. <laughs> but yeah, but uh, she's right. Uh, she's right in, 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 in how uh, such uh, categorization, labeling, uh, really affects uh, affects uh, uh, real life in 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 so many different cases. Uh, uh, so is the case. Uh, so is the case in the American history of uh, how um, LGBTQ homosexuality was once considered a disease. And so there were so many sick people, <laughs> and with with that strike of law when it was kind of taken out of the list of disease, so many people got cured at the very moment. So yeah, this is a very valid uh, question that she's raising, uh, that, uh, that one has to be watchful. One has to be watchful about this and then not give in to the pressure, not give in to, uh, not give in to the implications there, rather take charge and know that that could happen that is coming and then take your uh, take uh, take action against that with 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 awareness with mm -hmm. alertness mindfulness uh, so so that's that, that that's all i can say and then then in different situations it, uh, what you do how you do uh, may vary but one doesn't have to kind of give in to that not give in to such pressures otherwise if we don't take conscious action and make conscious effort, uh, then yes, we could we could become victims uh, to this. So, so, uh, and partly, maybe I, I'll, 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 I'll leave it there. Uh, uh, partly it has to do with uh, cultures uh, and we, along with cultures, it has to do with what our uh, range of perspective is towards existence. And, and thus, how much of a space we have to account for things. And so, so that has to be also taken into account. Uh, so without being specific, I'm just throwing it there. Uh, but, but basically what I'm saying is that one doesn't have to give in to those pressures. Those are very real pressures, particularly, uh, I mean, that's true with anything. Like you move from one place to another with different cultures and whatnot. Now the recognition, the understanding, and the value, the respect, all of those will shift. One has to be very cognizant about the different contexts that one is in. And that's going to be extra aware of, of dealing with them appropriately so that one doesn't suffer from that. Yet at the same time be equipped with how to deal with that when somebody does get affected by it through one's own example, through one's own uh, skillfulness and whatnot. So not give in to that. Be aware of it, cognizant of it, and know, know it coming, and then see how to avert that by, by, by really kind of looking deeper into the complexity of how uh, that's happening in, 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 in the established culture that it is, and then and, and, and then kind of uh, see uh, what, what are the elements at, at play. I'll just add a couple of thoughts. I agree with what Kesha said, and I'll add a few thoughts. Like, one is I'll say, you know, even as a psychologist, I work, you know, I'm, one of my areas of specialty is trauma. So I work with many people who have experienced trauma. And I actually think, you know, I think your question is very good. And also I think it, I think where it's, uh, I think, um, really important point actually is that the the people who are saying that to you are ignorant about the nature of trauma and the nature also of different cultures and um and i'll say actually I'll say, i mean i'll say it very strongly they're wrong um you know and what i mean by that is this is that you know in one way you know first of all of course trauma is a, is a label um but but partly when we look at like what psychology means by trauma it's a particular set of like physiological and brain reactions that I think can properly be called trauma. And actually nobody can tell somebody else they were traumatized. Um, 
In other words, uh, a person has to, in other words, there is such a thing as trauma and, and different things traumatize different people. But, um, and I shall share, like I, I've often thought about this topic very much because, actually because of some, I, I can think of many, but a couple of examples of Tibetan teachers I know. Like um, one was, uh, my, one of my teachers was uh, uh, Reba Rinpoche, who was tortured for many years uh, in uh, communist Chinese prison camps. And I, and, you know, as a psychologist, I was always intrigued by this because I thought he wasn't traumatized though. Even though he was tortured, he wasn't traumatized. I remember once I asked, I was talking to Gyume Kinsar Rinpoche one day, and he, was I, I, he didn't want to talk about it, but I kept asking him to tell his story of leaving Tibet, you know, and, and his experience. And then um, he told me the story of his the monastery being bombed and things like that. And I made a big mistake, actually. My own ignorance came out, because he was telling the story about escaping, and I said, oh, that must have been difficult. And, uh, and Gyume Kinsar Rinpoche looked at me and said, I didn't say it was difficult. Why did you say it was difficult? And I thought, I, I apologize, I thought oh, I was wrong, actually. Um, it was my cultural insensitivity. And, and I'm saying it from my own experience. I was being culturally insensitive and wrong. And the people who say that to you are wrong. Um, so in other words, because we, can't, we, we should not and cannot impose you are traumatized to anybody, actually. So well, the correct thing about trauma is if the person themselves has some experience. In other words, there are certain sets of experience. If somebody is having symptoms of trauma. They can't sleep and they're having flashbacks and they're having physiological reactions of hypervigilance where their body is getting very activated and they uh, feel terrified over a small trigger. You know, those are symptoms of trauma. And if somebody has those symptoms, you know, um, you know and they're suffering from them, well, then, that's pro then there's a use in calling that trauma, right? Because there's treatment and you can get better. So if somebody's having symptoms, let's say like that, right? They're waking up with night terrors and they're having flashbacks and they're having intrusive images of something that happened now that's a problem and they're suffering. And then if they come and say, I'm having this problem and you say, oh, that's trauma. Okay, we can fix that. That's useful. But to say to somebody else, because you had some difficult experience, you're traumatized, that's insensitive, it's culturally inappropriate, but it's also personally inappropriate, even, with, even within a culture, actually. You know, somebody, I've known people like that, like um, actually my own grandfather's example. He went through experiences that somebody else might've called traumatizing. They weren't traumatizing to him, actually. Um, you know, I remember talking to him about it as a kid. And so, in other words, it depends on the person. And, I'm, and I want to make one more last point also, that if the person's having a physiological and brain reaction, that is how the brain reacts to trauma, then that's something, also even that, then that needs to be addressed. But if you're not having those symptoms, then it's really not proper to tell somebody else they're traumatized. So I, I, that I just want to say very strongly, it's a, it's a mistake on the person's point. And it's a kind of insensitive mistake. Uh, and they're just, they're labeling it incorrectly, actually. Oh, Dr. La, that's really eye-opening. Very interesting, very eye-opening. And uh, I think, yeah, you made a very, very strong and clear point. Again, grounded in your own practice. I, I, I'm reminded of a story that His Holiness and I am very often shares in public teachings. When the, uh, he speaks of an elderly Namjel monastery monk that, who eventually uh, managed to come into exile and spent the last few years of his life in, in Namjel monastery. And His Holiness, uh, says that uh, he was very close to them, to him, and then he would share his own personal stories. At one point, he would say that, oh, at some times I felt danger. And his holiness felt that maybe danger of being, danger to his life, danger to being sub subjected to torture or whatnot, after having been really put through all those problems. And his holiness was surprised by what he said. He said, danger of losing compassion to them. So, which means that all through that, he has succeeded in augmenting his sense of compassion of where all of those, what do you call, untoward actions were coming from, from their own ignorance, from their own giving into their afflictions, what not. So instead, he was gaining in his strength of compassion, love, in the face of that problem, instead of get instead of being traumatized and whatnot, be that on the brain level or the physiological level, he was, his brain was becoming more and more activated in the love and compassion areas. And that's affecting his physiology as a whole. So that's very eye-opening of how it is contextual. And, but at the same time, if the person himself or herself is undergoing those symptoms, then that's a clear indication. You should not merely kind of hide it under the, under the rug. One has to kind of deal with it. But then again, have to be watchful in not, not doubling down on it. 
by one's own projections and dwelling and indulging, whatnot. Kind of be practical in dealing with it. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Gisela, did you want to add something, Gisela Sundaragala? <laughs> No, there are a few other questions. Uh, my question is not that important. <laughs> Just curiosity, the mantra decision for anxiety, but I will ask when we have time. Otherwise, okay. Ask the other questions first. Alayla um, Sadishla. Ani Thangi, Bill Johnson had a question and then we'll take some long do after. Yeah, Gishila, doctor, thanks so much. Uh, so building off that in, in terms of uh, the, the trauma or, or it, yeah, if there is oppression uh, and someone identifies it that it is oppressive actions being taken, how can someone, uh, how can someone, uh, what do we do in the face of that oppression maybe happening to someone else, whether that oppression is coming from a person or a group of people or a system um, and that oppression is uh, mental, physical, emotional, it's been identified by the people as uh, uh, something not good. Um, how do we, uh, how do we as outsiders take uh, a compassionate approach to it all and a mindful approach uh, in sticking up for them or even the word, you know, fighting for justice. The word fight is a bit, can be seen as aggressive or you know, can fighting for justice be be done compassionately, if if that makes sense? It's up to you. Okay, let me deal with it. Yes, uh, I think this is a very pertinent question that they followed up uh, uh, our uh, discussion earlier. Uh, as much as it sounded like earlier that uh, no matter how much oppression is coming from outside, uh, if one could succeed in kind of really uh, uh, retaining one's composure in the face of it, uh, and if possible, even kind of, uh, what do you call, benefit off of it uh, in terms of becoming more strong in one's compassion, love, et cetera, and seeing where the complexity is coming from, and even succeeding in generating love and compassion towards the other or not. What is very important is uh, to also know if some action even if it is not affecting adversely to you, if that is wrong, it needs to be pointed out. Uh, it needs to be pointed out for, for, for the sake of others. And, and also for the sake of the perpetrator himself or herself, for the sake of his or her uh, posterity, his or her offsprings and whatnot. We are in a, such an interdependent uh, situation in the interdependent world that uh, uh, if we want to really do a good job in caring up, uh, after ourselves, caring after our community, we should be as much caring about what others do. And particularly if there's something wrong and whatnot, then we need to be really standing up uh, and against that and, and, and addressing it. Of course, it, addressing it with, with, with a sense of uh, uh, love, compassion, composure, because that way we will do a better job in really addressing the problem squarely, not just do something in the sake, in the, in the name of doing something, but in, instead uh, messing it up uh, or making it even worse. So that is very important. Now in terms of what could be done, uh, that cannot be just one thing, objective thing, that will vary on so many different situations in terms of what one's expertise is, what one's relationship is, what one's situation is, all of those. But one should not give up on uh, doing things, even if that be kind of encouraging someone, uh, guiding someone, or kind of making it known to others. So there could be so many ways of doing it, but all throughout, not with, if possible, not with a sense of animosity. Because if we start out with that, right from the very beginning, it's like taking a wrong road. And then when the more we go along that road, the further we will be away from really reaching a sensible, reasonable solution. So yeah, as much as I may have sounded like, so long as you are yourself individually capable of handling it and even kind of growing from that in spiritually and that it should be okay, 
But I'm saying that because of that capacity, now you have an added responsibility to really stand up to the injustice and do something. Now, because you are more capable in retaining, in maintaining your composure and thus be able to see the problem more clearly and more openly. And that's the solution that you uh, hit at or, or you hear about. You'll be able to do a better job in, in making the uh, decision, in making the choices. So there's this need of rethinking just about everything that we have so far done as a society, even if it is as justice. How do we do justice? Justice needs to be really, really justice in, in, in the true sense of the word, uh, in really striking at the source of the problem, not just following one, 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 one rule of, 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 of penalizing someone and, and, and be done with that, but rather really rooting it out looking at the root of it. Okay, uh, Dr. Ladner, did you wanna- I'll just add a couple quick thoughts, like a brief, one actually, <clears throat> um, I, think there, I think it's a very complicated, important, good question, a complicated question. And, but, and so there are many layers of answer, but it actually, as Keshla was talking, I was remembering an, uh, something I, I read recently. It was a story about, a, um, it was actually a black man who's a professor who was, who had been pulled over by police wrongly and was, he felt his life was threatened. But he made this point actually, he said, um, there was one person who stayed there filming and looking at him kindly. And he said that was what helped him get through that moment and not completely freak out. Um, and so I guess one point I was gonna make is showing up, you know, like, cause part of what I guess I'm saying now switching to, I think he was getting, that professor was getting at something very deep, which is part of what makes us feel traumatized, when people do have a trauma reaction, Oftentimes it's feeling powerless and alone. Or is it, when our physiology reacts that way, usually it's because we feel overwhelmed by ex something ex outside of us, but then inside of ourselves, we feel powerless and we feel alone. And so, and I always notice that when I work with people who are traumatized, that that was their subjective experience in the moment. Nobody ever felt empowered when they were traumatized and nobody ever felt, and, and everybody feels somewhat alone, let's put it that way. I mean, sometimes maybe if it's a child, they had a sibling who was also being abused or something, but but usually people feel alone. And so one thing we can do is just show up for somebody else, you know, and be present, uh, whether it's in that moment when they're being harmed or afterwards. But if somebody feels they have somebody there who cares, um, that makes them less likely to, to be as deeply psychologically harmed by the experience. I mean, not that you can totally take away somebody else's harm, but you can be present in a loving way to them as a person. And that does make a difference. One is one point I wanted to make. And then um, a couple other points I was gonna make. Another is like, in terms of healing trauma, I've always been struck by this as a psychologist is that people, it's hard to heal trauma if you, don't, if you still don't feel safe. You know, so the question like, what can we, you know, if somebody else is feeling unsafe, what can we do to help them feel safe? Because then their trauma can be, if they are traumatized, it's not likely to heal very effectively until they feel safe. And um, I was noticing as I joined a group recently of uh, Buddhists who were trying to, in relation to the Black Lives Matter movement, was trying to have some help, do something, you know. And um, and uh, the person who had started it was a, um, a Korean a Zen teacher, but he said we have to get the leadership has to be from. Uh, he was making a point. He said I, I can't lead this, and he said well, you shouldn't. I don't want to lead it either. It should be um, in that case. It should be um, Black Buddhists who are leading it. And when, um, and one point they made is when they, when he asked a number of them, uh, teachers, who, what, what should we focus on? Uh, they said, um, trauma informed help, you know, uh, because they were feeling traumatized, right? And so the idea was to have some groups and some, you know, to help heal that trauma, because the idea was they were saying, well, how can we help others unless we focus on healing ourselves? So some of those teachers were saying, let's have some um, experiences for uh, people who have been traumatized and for their students to experience some therapeutic healing in order to then be present to others and, and try to spread that out through the community. Um, so I think what I'm getting at there is like creating at least moments of safety or safe places where that can happen was one thing I was, you know, I, I didn't really help much to be honest. I, I still hope I can, but so far I haven't done much to help, uh, but I hope I can help over time. Um, 
and the last point I was going to make, which is agree with what Geshe said, was you know I, I often also think of one of my um, personal heroes is, is uh, Elie Wiesel, who is a Holocaust survivor, famous author. You know, and, and he always said that point. He said, you know, I forget the exact quote, right? But he said something like, you know, to be neutral in the face of injustice, you know, is not good, right? He said, he said uh, you know, neutrality leaves you on the side of the oppressor. That was his point, right? Um, so to take action, you know, and, and as Geshele said, to take action motivated by love, which is actually what Martin Luther King Jr. said. And actually, you know, I, I often, wait, the last thing I'll say, you know, the, I often think about this, like, you know, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr. followed that. But really that movement start, uh, uh, started from uh, Henry David Thoreau in his, his essay on civil disobedience, right? uh, where he was taking the Indian idea of ahimsa and thinking about how do you apply that in a social context, right? And, um, and so he borrowed that idea from India, you know, and then he wrote, he sort of uh, wrote that essay where he was saying, and he went to jail actually, right? It was about the, it was in the context of the um, Mexican American war uh, that um, he, he, had, he refused to pay his taxes to support a war and he went to jail, right? And uh, his friend Emerson, right? Ralph Waldo Emerson said, let me pay your taxes. And he said, no, you cannot pay my taxes. I want to stay in jail. I refuse to support a war and I won't let you support a war on my behalf. You know, that was non-harm, right? And, uh, and if you think about it, I thought, sometimes I think, what was the use of that? He was one guy sitting in a jail cell, who cares, right? But he wrote an essay sitting in that jail cell that Mahatma Gandhi later read, you know, and that was one of the many inspirations for Gandhi. So I think sometimes, wow, we don't know the effect of our actions, do we? You know, like yes, to do exactly. something that's non-harm is very important, isn't it? That's true. Uh, okay, so in the interest of time, so we'll take a question from Tsing Wangdala and then Geshla will be the last question. Uh, so Tsing Wangdala, do you want to unmute your microphone? Yeah, uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, yes. hello. Hello, just to like Gisela and uh, Dr. Ladner. Uh, I would like to ask a question. Um, so my question is like, especially coming from an environment where some communicate less and interact less has left difficulty of articulating thoughts and words. I would like to know the way of dealing through it. What initiative can I take emotionally? Is that clear? <laughs> I missed a couple of the words, I don't know. Um, so my question is, so I come from an environment where I communicate less and interact less, and it has led the difficulty uh, articulating thoughts and words. So I would like to know the way of dealing through it. So what initiative can I take? Like, uh, so because you said, of, I understood that you said you're communicating less and interacting less, but then you said, pot, I couldn't understand the pot. And it has uh, lead, led to difficulty of articulating thought and words. Oh, did you say the la that last part again of? Oh, well, what initiative can I take uh, emotionally? So I think, yeah, what Tim Wandel is asking is, you know, uh, in today's society, now we're much more isolated. We live in our own world. We communicate less with people. So that in turn leads to um, a difficulty in articulating our thoughts and ideas. So what can he do or we do? And what are some initiatives we can take to kind of help with that as well as kind of emotional well-being? Oh, sorry, yes. my sound wasn't so good. I, I apologize. Uh, Gesha, do you want to go first? Yeah, no, 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 you must go. <laughs> <laughs> There, there, there is a Hindi song where you say, Pele up, Pele up, Pele up, out of respect. You go first, you go first, you go first. Oh. <laughs> so I said it last, you go first. <laughs> I think it's a very, well, I'll say, I, mean, I don't have some great answer, but I think, I think it's a, such a common problem right now, isn't it? Because of the sense of, um, you know, the uh, situation in the world. Um, and, You know, I think uh, well, I'm just pausing and think about like what is that? You know, it is so important. But the other is like um, I think it's really important actually that we focus. Let's see, say this right. You know, I guess what I'm getting at is that I'm trying to think through it. If we allow this circumstance to just create like distance, right? And there are a lot of things. Actually, I pause. There are a lot of things right now creating this. Right. The main one is the pandemic course, that's creating, you know, the, we have to do um, social distancing and, you know, a certain amount of that. Um, 
But then also, you know, there's polarization in this country. There's a lot of polarization that also is creating distance between people and things like that. But um, I actually think it's very important on a practical level that we, I want to say two different things, actually. One is, I'm going to step back for a second. One is, there's actually scientific research showing this, actually. So I'll start with this, that this is a time to meditate on love and compassion in oneself, even when you're apart from others, if that makes sense. Like, um, you know, so if you actually spend time meditating on that, there's actually scientific research. So it helps us then when we do connect to actually, when we do talk to somebody to be more connected and to have better social interactions. So one point I would make is when we're alone, this is the time, we have more time uh, separate to actually meditate more on love and compassion is one point. And then another point I want to share just from my own personal experience a little bit and also from seeing with patients is um, like in, I have a suggestion actually, a practical suggestion, which is when you do some, if you do that, if you step back and do some meditation on love and compassion, then to regularly ask yourself, what's some loving action I can do to connect with others? You know, and, and what I find actually is that, you know, some people are getting too isolated right now and it's actually harm, harming their mental health, you know, and, and it's not good actually. But then I see also other times, and even in myself, I've seen this actually. Like just the other day, I thought, um, I did that, I was meditating on compassion. And then I, I remembered something a friend had said about his own trauma, actually, it was a, an old friend. And I thought, wow, you know, I wanna say some more to him out of friendship, you know, and I wrote him a long email and I just expressed my appreciation of him and my appreciation of his bravery. And then I had another friend who had lost a friend, you know, one of his friends actually had suicided. And I'd been sympathetic when he told me, but I thought, you know, what else can I do to express love to him? And so that I reached out to him and, um, and both of them re reacted, said, oh, that meant so much right now because, you know, they're going through hard times and there's nobody else. Maybe they, you know, they only, each of them only sees like one or two other people. You know, so the fact that I called them and then emailed them and then did other things, then it meant something. And so my point is, is like, I think right now is a really a good time. So one is to meditate on love and compassion, but the other is out of that meditation to say, to be creative. And I've seen patients doing this where like, you know, some are like, actually, I'll just share one more example. Even, even in my neighborhood, I noticed that. Like nobody's getting together, of course, much. Some people, I guess, a little bit, but not much. You know, that people usually hang out, but nobody's hanging out. But then, um, you know, people, uh, actually it was through an app, somebody started a discussion, you know, people started some discussion groups and then one person started one on um, race in America. You know, and people of different races are gathering together and sharing their experiences. And suddenly I realized like, wow, I feel closer to my neighbors through this online group than I ever did in person because people are sharing their deep experiences of discrimination in that case. And I thought, wow, that was so creative of that person, right? To say, let's just do that as neighbors, you know, share this intimate thing. And so my point is, is this is a time to be creative. You know, we can't do our normal ways of connecting, but if you're creative and thinking, how can I reach out to others in compassion? We can come up with ways and you'll find, this has been the last thing I'll say, you'll find that it really touches people's hearts right now. Whereas if you do that, if you do something out of compassion, like my neighbor did, or like, you know, different, I've seen, I can think of many examples of, of patients or friends who are doing that, then it's even more touching in a way to other people because everybody appreciates it so much right now. So I would encourage you and, you know, um, to do that, to meditate a little bit, but then after the meditation, say, what's something I can do today? And each week to do some things that are expressions of that to others. Uh, it's, that's our way of making the world a better place, actually, right now in this dark, dark time. Anyway. Yeah. yeah, I totally agree with it, Dr. La. Yes, uh, partly I think this, this may have to do with how we level this, 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 this habit of uh, keeping distance. We have uh, started out calling it social distance, and so, those, so that's how I think that may be kicking in and kind of make thinking that we are socially distanced from others. Oh, but actually what it is, is physically distant, but doesn't have to be socially distant. In a way, through these technologies, we are kind of, in some ways, and not, maybe not for everyone, but in so many pe people, this has kind of brought people much more closer and uh, from so many different areas. Like, like look at the teachings. Now teachings are attended by people from all over the world, which was not the case at all. And even when the technology was there, somehow people didn't uh, di uh, didn't use it this way. But now that's this being this is the only option. People are all kind of going for it, and then that's how it ended up kind of really reaching out to so many. And so uh, one way to make up for this uh, sense of uh, 
uh, lack is uh, to kind of uh, be creative in using uh, this wonderful uh, technology uh, and uh, uh, either reaching with actual people that you know through them more people or else kind of looking for the appropriate materials online and really it's amazing what is there available you begin to really you have no choice but to really feel indebted and grateful to people with no names who may whoever may have really cared to post them to make them available for you right readily so there are so many materials there uh, which you one could uh, make up for whatever uh, uh, one is interested in. And another thing is I'm, I'm thinking of using our wonderful technology of imagination. And in other words, in spiritual words, it's called visualization. <laughs> we may call it imagination. You kind of, the, you kind of play with it, use it and kind of imagining in different situations that can really bring real feelings and real uh, sense of involvement and, and who knows through that the creativity uh, uh, bell can uh, go. And so, so there's different ways, I mean, uh, that one could explore and see uh, what works uh, best one with oneself. So, any questions in You have the last question. <laughs> okay, uh, I like to skip my question because it's not important. <laughs> so time is running out. It must be tired, all of you. So just was want to say thank you, Gishila and uh, Dr. Ladnala, so enthusiastically sharing your wisdom to us. It's very helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank, yeah, thank, thank you so very much for this opportunity. Yeah, we are yeah. honored. <laughs> thank you, Gishla. Thank you, Dr. Ladner, both of you for being here and sharing your insights and knowledge and wisdom with all of us. So thank you so much. From OTE. Most welcome. Thank, thank you for organizing this. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then I thank just you, to share, we have our last session for the day today, which almost seems like a continuation of today's topic. Um, it's on mind training, Lojong uh, led by Gishlo Suntargila, and it'll be from 6 to 7.30, same Zoom meeting ID. So. If you have more questions on mind training, Gishla will be there to answer questions. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you everyone so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Gishla. Thank you. 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 Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thank you so much. Gishla.